All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everyone today to today's FX seminar. Uh, my name is Iqbal Branch. I head up marketing for Advantage Futures. I'm really excited about today's seminar because we've got Dave Schultz and Cornelius Luca here. Uh, I've worked with Dave for almost five years now, and Cornelius, I think we met first at an FX summit back at the CME back in 2004. So it's exciting to have these guys talk here today uh, with Advantage Futures. Just by a quick way of introduction, Dave Schultz is the director of FX products for the CME Group. Uh, previous to joining the CME, he was an independent floor trader in the CME FX markets and held FX brokerage sales management roles for Merrill Lynch on the CME trading floor. Cornelius Luca is the president of Luca Global Research. He's been engaged in trading and consulting about global currency markets since 1983. He teaches courses at the uh, New York University, the New York Institute of Finance, the Lubin Graduate School of Business at Pace University. And he's the, also the author of Trading in Global Currency Markets. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave Schultz. We will have a Q&A at the very end, and uh, feel free to ask questions throughout. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you uh, for everyone for taking the time out. Um, originally, they asked me to give this presentation, and I actually have been in foreign exchange for about 29 years, and I have a really strong background in technical analysis, but when you work for the exchange, you can't really give any forward thinking, and with that, um, I decided I think it would be a great idea to bring uh, Cornelius. I've known Cornelius for a long time, but well, actually for six years. Um, but I've taken his course probably 20 years ago at the New York Institute of Finance. And so it's, it's interesting that we, uh, our paths are, have crossed. I think you're going to find his presentation very intriguing. You will find out uh, certain things about technical analysis or fund uh, fundamental analysis. And overall, it should be a great presentation. I'm just going to give a quick overview kind of where we are as the exchange, and then we can move on. Um, in October, which is really terrific for us, uh, we actually had a record month. Um, we, did, we averaged 747,000 contracts per day. Uh, that's 99 billion uh, notional value on a daily basis. What's interesting about it is um, if you look at our really our big currency or our most liquid currency has always been the euro dollar. And we've really moved on. I mean, if you look at like Aussie dollar, it, you know, six years ago, you'd probably get 20 points wide. We had a record month in that where we're doing, um, in the Aussie, 8 billion in notional or 89,000 contracts. And if you actually look at the bid-ask spread, it's one and two points wide. That is amazing. Of course, you have, it's a, um, a carry trade, which is going on right now, but you also have the fact that, um, you know, it is a commodity currency. So as you see, you have Australian, you have Canadian dollar. But again, these are products you should look at in terms of adding to your trading if you haven't looked at it. One that isn't really mentioned up here that we've seen considerable success in as well has been our Mexican peso contract. And when we visited Mexico about a year ago, really we had a little fallout, of course, with all the forward points and the whole world practically collapsed in a year ago. But they really didn't have any counterparty um, comfort. The banks would actually try to deal with each other for 45 minutes. They would, they would actually have a position on, and they couldn't get out because the other side of the trade, they would try to execute the trade with their own banks um, in the interbank market, and they would have to wait till they would actually have to get every single deal approval uh, by the risk department to do the counterparty trade. Well, by that time, this market can move pretty drastically. So, with that, you know, we actually gave some presentations. And we've seen a lot of um, participants join our market. Uh, just an overall, I, I think it's a good picture. Uh, if you look at our currencies and our volume, um, certainly you can look at 2008 in September when really everything fell apart. Um, but we've come back strongly. Um, what we had, again, is the same thing. We had a lot of traders that were trading uh, spot FX uh, against our products and trying to arb our market or any type of uh, algo. Um, systems that came into it, and they really couldn't uh, do an accurate or really judge the market because the forward market was traded like spot. So we've seen, of course, uh, forwards uh, have improved. They aren't back to what they were, but they've gotten better, and we've seen also considerable and in many, many new participants. The great thing about our exchange, 
we have, um, we have multi-asset classes on one exchange. Uh, hopefully some of you traders are currently trading our product or you're trading interest rates or equities and you'll look to add these products to your mix. Same thing in the options. Options even in the OTC market is probably down 50 percent, 45 to 50 percent from last year. Um, we saw the same results, uh, certainly with volatility and all the other factors and just the risk factor of the internal uh, systems of the bank, um, I think they, we, we're actually seeing new participants come into this market. So it's back at around that 20,000 level. And as you all know, as soon as the market really hits that 20,000 level, it's really worth trading. I mean, you, you have enough open interest in the market, you have enough participation in the market, and hopefully we can grow this market from here. Uh, this is a really interesting slide for us. Um, as most of you know, EBS is the largest platform in the world um, in terms of it, the interbank market actually trading. Um, I have to be totally honest on the slide. Um, if you look at our market, we're up eightfold, which is really great. Really, we went electronic in 2001, and they're up twofold. But they did start with a bigger number. So if you looked at them a year ago, and I don't have their exact figures, and if anybody here is with EBS, I apologize. But say they were doing $260 billion uh, on a notional value per day. We were doing about $85 billion. Currently, we're doing $99 billion. Actually, their volume has dropped off to about 99 I'm sorry, their volume has dropped off to about $146 billion per day. Now, you could say we would gloat, and we think that's a great thing. We actually don't look at it that way. We look at it that... Um, we'd like to see both markets grow. It's been a healthy uh, seeing their markets grow as well as our markets grow. We know there is a, a complementary nature in terms of trading spot versus futures. Um, but um, just overall, we think it's, it's, it's a healthy sign that our market is being consistent and growing. And this is just their percentage. I think year on year, we both publish our numbers. Uh, hopefully, uh, the person at our exchange that put this together, they're around down 36% on the year. We're down 5% overall. Uh, one of the things that we just made an announcement that we're planning on doing, um, it's actually a soft, uh, how would you say it? A soft launch announcement. We are actually going to clear OTC products. So we're going to take spot transactions. Um, yeah. Basically, we're going to offer eight currency pairs, the ones that are listed up there. Um, it's really, you control how, with whom, and what terms you want to trade. You can take your foreign exchange or your spot two day, th three months, six months, out to five year, ten years, and you can actually put it on our exchange. We are not going into the front end business. Um, this is, you know, post execution because our clearance services are really what we're, we've been good for. We haven't had a default in this business. Uh, it's going to offer cross-margining, so if you have an OTC position and you have futures, if you're along, say, the future 5,000 futures and the equivalent in the spot, you could put it on the exchange and you actually will get cross-margining. Um, we have internal readiness. That's around December 19th, I believe we're calling for. We're looking for this to launch in the early part of 2010. And, I, you know, one of the big things that you should know about it is the reason we've only added those, uh, the, the eight currencies that were listed up there is um, the SEG fund treatment. You get 40 treatment. Um, the CFTC has approved those already. So we're waiting for um, uh, CFTC approval, and then we'll launch these. We are also going to, you're going to be able to trade NDFs. You're going to be trade, uh, able to clear options and, and forwards. Um, one of the interesting things, actually, Mike Homan back in the back of the room, and if you have any questions after Cornelius' presentation, uh, March 22nd, we launched our uh, eMicro. It's a tenth of the size of our standards contract. I believe we're just doing over 5,500 contracts in all the six pairs that are listed there. Um, it's early in the stage. We think it's very successful so far uh, based on just the fact that we have some, a lot of the FCMs that are in the retail space that are putting uh, their sales plan together and actually going out to their customers. The nice part about it, it is in interbank terms, which is the first time we've done this. Um, it's a tenth the size of our standard size contract. It's a tenth the size if you look at the, uh, the margin requirements. 
and we have two market makers uh, and actually we have a couple more market makers coming on very shortly so if you're looking at a product that you know a kind of a if you're starting out and you're look, looking to learn foreign exchange or try your models uh, certainly it's a great vehicle but in terms of if you're a long-term player and uh, you know money is an issue or you just want to get a comfort feeling it's almost like a stock you can hold it in your position and I, I think you're gonna find that you know it's a, a great mix for our suite we have this micro we have a mini pair we have in the euro and the yen and we also have our standard size contract one of the things I, I'm sure most of you have looked at but I think it's really key to look at um, wherever you are you can always view our prices so we take our futures price and we put it in the spot equivalent but the nice thing is if you hit that drop down arrow you can actually view all our currencies but one of the things that we've really noticed which has really been missing for the last eight months is our depth of book because we will actually show you our depth of book on the bid side and the offer side and that depth of book has not been that great lately we have been told by many dealers and a lot of hedge funds actually our depth of book has gotten really really back pretty much to normal and people can get their business done so it, it's a very helpful screen you can view all our products if you have any um, you know if you think that well in the OTC market yeah I can always get a better price I would take this um, it's a free and on that and I would compare the quotes and I, I think you'll find with the liquidity and all the different um, currencies that we provide it, it's very it be very helpful and I think you'll find that um, you'll see that you, you should add, add the CME to your mix of trading. Again, um, one of the other things I wanted to point out, you know, we have a great marketing department, we have a great education department, we have a great product staff that, you know, we think about what we should put on our website. And yes, we sometimes, our website, it's difficult to find things, but if you do find the things that are on our website, you're going to find it very interesting. Um, and I think very useful in your daily trading. We have Cornelius here today, but he actually does uh, free market commentary daily on our website. So he does a recap of each product's traded price. Uh, he does an analysis of the factors that influence price and a recap of any reports that day. And again, this is on our website and it's free. Some of the educational resources. Um, we have two courses that are actually being combined into one we had dynamics of foreign exchange and advanced trading strategies uh, they are free courses they are um, certainly they are based on heavily talked about futures in these courses but they also give you an understanding of trading forwards trading swaps trading um, cross currency pairs um, I think you'll just get a really good understanding of the market overall um, we work very hard on this and actually now Cornelius is uh, I believe you're combining both these courses and there's going to be a new course that's going to be released in January. Um, there's a, a many trading examples in there and actually we have an archive. If any of you have technical analysis or would like to learn more about technical analysis, uh, we have Dan Gramza, we have uh, many people talking about Fibonacci, uh, whether it's candlesticks and their archive presentations and they're pretty well done so I would, I would also view them. The Daily Bulletin, we get calls about it, you know, I think uh, in my introduction, I've actually been doing foreign exchange for about 29 years. I ran Merrill Lynch's group on the floor for around 18 years. And I don't think there was a day that went by or anybody on the trading floor that didn't have a daily bulletin uh, the first thing when they walked in. And one of the reasons I bring this up is, you know, certainly as a trader, you want to see what open interest is. If you're looking and doing any technical analysis, you want to know the high, the low, the close. Um, certainly you want to, you know, see the change in open interest. And one of the good things in Cornelius' presentation today, he'll be talking about the commitment of Trader's Report. And it's, it's worthwhile and if you're trading anything to see what the uh, long or short positions are in the, in the market. But anyway, it, this is available. We get calls wondering where it is. Um, I, they've actually put a link and it's pretty easy to find these days. And just to sum it up, our trading hours, we open up at 5 p.m. on Sunday evening. And we close 4 p.m. the next day, and then we shut down for one hour, that's central time, and then we begin the next day's trading day. But anyway, I just want to give you an overview. Um, I really think you should take a look at our website. You'll find research papers, white papers that uh, people have really put some thought in, and we've, we've reviewed them, 
and I think you'll find them very interesting. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Cornelius. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. And thank you very much to Advantage and CME for having me here tonight. Uh, the idea is to give you a bit of introduction to foreign exchange because apparently you all know about uh, uh, fixed income markets and commodities on the good, difficult stuff. And uh, people sometimes get a bit scared about foreign exchange. And I'm still trying to pitch the idea that actually it's a very good thing to trade and makes you tons of money. So before we go into the research, uh, just a, a bit of a shameless plug of, of a couple of books. Um, just in case, though, seriously, if you care about foreign exchange in a bit more detail, but you, look at, you may want to look at the book on the left side, and if you care about tech analysis in a bit of detail without get, getting you too bored, uh, take a look on the, on the right side, but covers all possible markets. Um, all right, so what Dave was thinking about talking to, tonight, so that's what I put in the agenda, is the role of foreign exchange among the classic asset markets. What I'm thinking about the financial markets at the end of, of this year, <clears throat> and a bit of comparison between the FX futures versus the OTC uh, FX uh, market. So let's see what's uh, let's see what's going on. Now, FX is a bit strange among the, the classic asset markets. Now, this being said, of course, you all know that the, the oldest two financial markets were, of course, commodities and foreign exchange equities and uh, fixed income markets came in much, 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 much later. So that's one thing. Second thing is the effects are a bit strange because you don't have an exchange market to speak of. So uh, you trade the equities, you use whatever market you like, and commodities, and you go to some market. In effects, you don't have that. So the only exception is going to be the CME group, and of course, the market is uh, sort of uh, here. Um, because of that, FX means you trade whatever you can, whenever you want to trade, and you trade 24 7, or to be exact, 24, five and a half days a week, which means on the plus side, you can do whatever you want, whenever you want to do it. And like in any, everything else, you have a phone, therefore you can trade. Um, so you can express your view at any given time of the day. Things do happen 24 7. In other markets where you don't have overnight markets, you have a bit of a problem. So it's a very big thing, a uh, very big advantage from this point of view. On the downside, you don't sleep that much. <clears throat> now, comparing FX to equity markets, I think the basic difference is whether, it, or whether it's equities or fixed income, you do have a domestic bias. I don't care how many international buyers you have, it's a domestic bias. In FX, it's very general, it's very international. In equities, of course, you have indexes, but uh, individual stocks, uh, you like this, you like that, you have a sector, you have some fundamentals that pertain to that, to that stock. We don't have those in FX. So it was a huge day yesterday in foreign exchange, dollar collapsed, well, one more time, because apparently there was a G20 meeting at the weekend and they said they're going to provide more help to support economies. Um, what, during the recession. So it sounded great and everybody jumped on it. It's a totally empty statement, but people just jumped on it and they expressed their view. Markets went wild, stocks went wild, and uh, that was it. So we don't have, so we ha in foreign exchange, you have very few issues, if you wish, very few instruments. You have a, f a handful of currencies. Surely you have 32 pairs, maybe, maybe more, but in reality, you only trade, what, 10 more aggressively? So you have very few. In equities, you have a lot. In commodities, you have a lot. Um, fixed income, you have, you have quite a few. In effect, not so many. Uh, also, if you look at the official picture, that's way too simple. So um, look at the second bullet point. If inflation is low, interest rates are low and stable, uh, life is good. That's what we have nowadays. Of course, the economy should be good. Well, it's not our case nowadays. So just because you have... The, the good official picture, low interest rates, low inflation, doesn't mean that that currency should be stronger than another uh, a currency. So the so-called fundamentals in foreign exchange uh, are very macro, whereas you look at the very micro type of market. All right, uh, what else? So because of that, like in every other, all the other markets, we have to look, of course, at fundamentals the best we can. 
but also have to look at other things that, saves, uh, that save our life. So uh, technical analysis, flows, and so on and so forth. So surely you trade, you look at fixed uh, technical analysis where we trade equities or FX or what have you fixed income, but in FX we don't have much of a choice but to look at, at technicals much, much more. So sort of bottom line is daily volume in foreign exchange is about $3.2 trillion a day. That's a bit more than the $30 billion the return over, they, do, they trade on the New York Stock, Stock Exchange. So it's a, we have a huge, huge market. And again, uh, we're talking about very few currencies all this money gets funneled through. Um, somebody from the CME who is not here, I know, he was very kind to put together this, uh, this uh, very nice uh, chart just to compare the volume in FX versus nice on a daily basis. <coughs> now, um, Dave was kind enough to point out volume in the past several years in, uh, in the currency futures, and here's your volume in the past, uh, in the past uh, couple of decades, quite significant changes. So it's really fantastic uh, uh, growth. The only time when we had a bit of a decline um, based on the survey done by the BIS was around the year 2000. But overall, it's a huge, huge uh, volume. I should point out that this year we had a bit of a decline in volume, like in everything else, but it began in September of last year. Uh, we'll, we'll go over this in a second, but now, as they pointed out before, we have a very nice recovery. So just very briefly, uh, why volume decreased back in uh, around 2000? So um, uh, the euro was introduced, which meant we had much fewer currencies to trade in Europe. We had fewer banks, pretty much like nowadays, but at the time it was the uh, good times. Now we have even, even fewer banks. Perhaps Lehman Barristers no longer uh, trade foreign exchange. Uh, and um, then we had a shift from voice brokers to uh, electronic brokers. And of course, this, there was a Southeast Asian crisis. People uh, traded much, much less. Now, what was much more important is FX exploded in volume after 2000. The Y2K thing was really great for us because we had a mini crash in stocks and the money managers had to put their money somewhere, and that somewhere became the new asset class, foreign exchange. And because I grew, up, grew in foreign exchange, grew up in foreign exchange, I'm not really sure what the big confusion is. Uh, why do you have trends in equities but not in foreign exchange? In fact, it's just the opposite way. It's more of a trend in FX than in, in other markets. Uh, why is there a scare about crazy uh, big fluctuations? Because we've seen what happened in the equity markets and commodity markets and so on and so forth. But it was new for some money managers. And also, typically, currencies tend to have a bit of a low correlation with the other asset classes. So when you have a portfolio, that's a very nice ingredient to have. Um, so the beta in our case, the betas in our case will be trend, carry, or volatility. And we have to, actually, this is the biggest challenge for any money manager. What am I now? Is it carry, is it trend, or is it volatility? All right, so volume uh, exploded because I mentioned you a couple of reasons. Also because funds in foreign exchange uh, got involved in a major, major way, and corporations found out that, in fact, you can put money in FX and make significant um, profits. Volume decreased this year, and again, uh, really starting from September of last year, because of a major global recession, and take your pick, the worst since 29, or the worst in the last 100 years, whatever you like. But basically, it's, uh, it's a huge, huge recession. And what this means is, or has meant, is really fluctuating appetite for risk. So back in September, October of last year, there was no appetite for risk. And that continued through, I would say, April or May of this year, even though we all know in hindsight that the bottom was put in back in March, but nobody was daring to get involved in the markets. And this is also another interesting thing about in foreign exchange. FX got hit um, without, with no fault of its own. Um, we don't have any kind of rogue uh, uh, funds in, involved in foreign exchange. We didn't have any kind of uh, subprime business to speak of. Uh, we had no brokers pushing funny stocks on anybody's throat. It was really the cleanest possible uh, industry to be in. Not that fixing uh, had any kind of problems. But uh, FX got hit because of risk aversion, and they also got hit because lots of corporations which were involved in FX had to uh, pull their money out because they took losses in, in other uh, markets. But really, through all we've been through since last year, 
the only market where I felt comfortable to trade in was FX. So nobody knew what was going to happen with Citibank and so on and so forth. FX was just do what you want to do. It's not a problem. So that was a big, big um, uh, source of um, confidence in trading uh, uh, the markets. Um, what else? Some of the emerging markets remain in danger. So on one hand, we're looking for help from one of the so-called emerging markets, China. On the other hand, you have others which are not doing so well, such as uh, Russia. It's doing better, but not so great. Uh, because Russia, Russian market means it's a one-horse uh, race, means oil. Oil is up nowadays, they're doing fine. Oil is not so good. A few months ago, Russia was uh, down. <clears throat> also, we have fairly mixed results in demand for commodities. Uh, nowadays, when we think commodities, really think China. And we are begging whatever it is out there, whatever it forces out there to, for China to do well. If they do well, maybe we'll do well as well. And we tend to think gold as a commodity. Well, gold is a bit of something else. So if you take a gold out of the equation, the others are like doing so-so. Uh, decreasing volume in, in, uh, in effects. I mentioned uh, fewer banks and even fewer funds. A lot of funds are done. <clears throat> so um, uh, Dave, I think, was very kind to put together a very nice comparison um, of volume with CME. And um, FX doesn't look that good. It's sort of in a fourth position here, but uh, remember, it's just currency futures. It's a small fraction of the whole volume. But if you look at the changes from last year, uh, FX lost the fewest, uh, 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 smallest amount of, uh, of volume. So it's, it's something positive to talk about this thing here. Now, going to the end of this year, this very bizarre year, what's there to expect? And uh, that's one thing. Second thing is, why should we look at intermarket market analysis? Well, you really can't trade anything. Uh, well, actually, you can, but not very well. Uh, you really can't trade anything on its own. You can't say, I only trade fixed income. I only look at uh, equities. I only look at foreign exchange and so on and so forth, because they all get connected. Now, this being said, you got to be careful, because correlations are your best friend and also your worst enemy at the same, almost at the same time. So in other words, correlations are extremely significant, but they don't last forever. So for as long as you don't really marry them, they're doing just fine for you. Um, so fixed income, I mentioned this before a little bit, fixed income and equity markets have a domestic uh, focus. Uh, and in, in a way, uh, I think it's nice to look at all these economic indicators and trade fixed income because the reaction is pretty, pretty obvious. In equities, it depends, because if the market is not open, who cares about uh, a horrible, horrible unemployment number at 30 because markets open much, much later. But in FX, they never close, so you can do whatever you, it is that you want to. Many commodities have a domestic bias. And by this, I don't mean the gold, which is the new worst currency, if you wish, but more like copper and other, uh, this, uh, other currencies. So in that case, there's a domestic bias. Uh, gold, of course, is a very international uh, focus. But in FX, of course, you have a clear international bias, which means everything and nothing can be a factor. So today can be a huge a factor. Tomorrow it may mean nothing. So that sort of keeps us on our tippy toes. Excuse me. <clears throat> so this is a, a simple chart looking at, I'm trying to just to test your vision, all those colors and lines. But really, from what I could barely see here, the highest correlation is going to be between gold and euro. And this is, uh, these are a couple of lines you can barely see going pretty much moving hand in hand. You can argue, if you look at cycles, that except for the 10-year uh, notes, they all put in the same low, uh, low, uh, low, they put the low at the same time, and they have highs at the same time but otherwise they diverge. So interestingly enough, until a few days ago, the, the, the S&P 500 was sort of following in the same pattern, but it seemed that it had peaked. And this may still be the case, by the way. And oil, it moved up, of course, in line with the other uh, markets, but not as much, not nearly as much. And here's another chart. Now, uh, hopefully, you can see a bit more of the S&P oil, sterling, and Canada. I just figured uh, oil, uh, the UK has some oil. Canada doesn't have oil per se, but they got natural gas. Let's see how they look. Uh, they look not so great. 
So in other words, the correlations are bits and pieces, whereas Sterling moved one way, Canada moved a <coughs> different way. Um, Sterling pound has a much bigger volume than Canada. Canada has commodities, but also the, has a huge, huge problems. problem. Let's just call that they export most of their stuff, 85%, to us, and we have a major recession. So they get, so it's a very unusual type of commodity currency. Now, what are we not right now? Um, well, we are sort of here in the life cycle. So we have low yields. Um, we, I used to make fun, I was going to say we used to make fun, but I used to make fun of the Japanese currency and their yields. They pretty much they had 0% forever. And how is that possible, I thought to myself. Such a great, great economy and they don't have, they have such low interest rates and those guys are forced to go outside the country and invest. And that's why I have a carry trade. I'm sure you all know the carry trade is you buy the currency with high yield like Australia and you sell the with a low yield like the Japanese yen. And you don't have much of a choice because you got to save for pension and kids and uh, former wives and cars and uh, yachts and airplanes and stuff. So you don't have much of a choice, but you got to invest outside the country because keep money in the bank in Japan gives you nothing. All the good old times. Now guess who's in the same position? So now I'm talking about carry trades. Well, what is your funding currency? What do you sell like there is no tomorrow? Well, let's call it the dollar. So I know it was a big day for the dollar falling yesterday, but really pretty much we are here. Low yields, we are a carry trade. Our currency is part of a carry trade, and it's weak. Is it undervalued? I'm not so sure about that because there's some big long-term problems, but it's right here. So hopefully we'll keep interest rates very low at what is, what is our, no, that's minus 4%, minus 5%. What do we have? A very real rate, not but 0.25 percent, because we have quant easing and all those things. So we're expecting, we are hoping for some strength in the economy, but in reality, that should not happen for about three years. So only then we can see a move towards this area, which we would love to be in once again. Now I sort of mentioned this before. I mentioned beta very beta very briefly before, uh, and again, the biggest challenge for a money manager for a money manager or a trader is every single day, uh, what am I in? Am I in a trend? Am I in a carry environment? Am I in a value environment? Or if you have to trade long term, really long term is going to be value. So uh, producing power parity. Now, of course, if you get a lot of carry, then it is going to give you a trend. So if you look in hindsight, because that's when we are very smart in hindsight, looking forward, they have a bit of a problem, but in hindsight, they're all very smart. All you have to do is just buy stocks, plenty of stocks back in, at the end of March and never sell and will be just fine right now. More gold. So, um, but basically it's, been, it's become clear that the dollar is the second, I mean, it's actually number one um, funding currency for a carry trade, which means sell, 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 there is no tomorrow. The second dollar is going to be the Japanese yen and then buy pretty much everything else. And given a choice, you don't want necessarily to buy euros when you have uh, good stuff such as the Aussie or New Zealand dollars, which have much, much higher interest rates and the promise of good economy, especially Australia, of course, and the promise that China will buy, buy, buy anything those guys produce. So here's your trade. And volatility here and here, where you have some significant moves, but um, that's, a different, uh, that's a different story. Now, where do we stand? We stood in a major, major recession. The big difference between now and a year ago is that we are no longer scared that Citibank or you name, I just chose Citibank because it used to be big at one point, um, or any other American bank will go under. I mean, significant large bank will go under. We know that's not going to be the case. Too many, uh, okay, let's change, let's, let's, let me rephrase this. So too many uh, significant uh, parties are uh, uh, vested in these banks, they are not going to go under. So from this point of view, it's nice and great. Uh, stock markets have been moving up enormously high for some reason, which is belief in the recovery, which is not going to happen, but everybody's trying to help in any way they can to stabilize the economy. So economies are being stabilized, not recovering, stabilized. Governments have, have undertook uh, numerous measures. They went way outside the box to, to help. Um, years from now, we'll be looking back 
and say these guys are totally crazy. Central banks around the world went crazy with this way with measures, but they took out, they did whatever they could, because basically they ran out of the normal ammunition, which is cutting interest rates. So they did, they went way outside that to provide some sort of help. And one of them, by the way, uh, we, we tend to get a bit uh, maybe scared. The dollar is going uh, to be very, very weak. It's been weak for a while. It's going to get even weaker. What's going on? Oh, my God. Well, actually, it's just good for us. And it's a tool to help us out of this recession. So having a, a low currency, it's a very good thing. And if you don't believe me, ask the Japanese, because their biggest possible dream is to think of their currency as garbage. You cannot be ever cheap enough. So when it's not as cheap, it, you, you know there's a political string being pulled. They don't have a choice. Somebody put a sort of gun to their head, if you wish, telling them, no, 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 yen is too weak. Yes, yes, and they tell you, oh, yes, yen is too weak. No, it's not. I mean, they cannot, I mean, they need to export stuff. We need to export some stuff to America. What you're exporting that much, but it makes a bit of a difference. If you look at the trade balance, it's been improving. So governments don't have much of a choice but to develop their currencies. Question is, who can do that? Plus, you really cannot do it uh, that openly. And if you noticed in the past several months, the ECB has continued to complain about the strength of their currency. They would love to have their currency much, much weaker. Now, here are the GDPs, the latest numbers in the GDPs. We'll get more numbers next week. So first quarter disaster, second quarter, it depends pretty much, if you wish, consolidation. Uh, not small uh, decreases, small increases, but nothing to talk about. And of course, uh, the third quarter for us came out at a whopping 3.2%, which we know is all very nice, but it's not going to last. But anyway, it's an attempt of recovery. So what you see is crisis versus consolidation, if you wish. Now, our GDP was fantastic, and we all got very excited for almost a day, which was really great. Being a Friday, it was just fine. Um, but it was a pretty much of a fake GDP. So it's one of those times I don't like, uh, um, I don't like theory because, you know, sort of put you to sleep and stuff. Uh, but it's a good time to look at the formula of, of a GDP because you got on this, when you see a number like this, 3.7%, um, where is the growth coming from? And it doesn't come from business spending. It doesn't come from consumer spending. So trade, let's not worry about trade uh, balance. So the only source of growth comes from government spending, which has been pretty obvious. So car sales, 1%. We added 1% of the GDP growth. Now, that's the nth governmental help to the auto industry, God bless them. So here's a few billion bucks. We blew it. Here's a few billion bucks. We blew it. Okay, let's give some money to... Let's call it uh, uh, cash flow clunkers, and that's another way of helping them. But once that went out, in September, sales collapsed, of course. Home building. Now, home building is a very, uh, 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 very touchy subject because every single time the U.S. economy has been in a recession, what brought it out of recession was housing. Now, the biggest source of the whole situation, whole crisis, has been the housing. So seeing growth now... And um, for how long and what kind of help it's going to be. And please keep it in mind, the problems of the housing sector ha have never been addressed. Between the subprime, between people being able to get a million uh, mortgages, those things have not been uh, addressed. Uh, also, as uh, you know, you have a commercial real estate, which is in trouble, so it's much more complex. But on the quarter... We had some growth coming from, from this area, which is not going to continue. It, it'll go the opposite way. And finally, the tax credits, uh, they're supposed to expire by the end of, the, of this month. Uh, apparently, they'll be extended for a, a few more months in the attempt to somehow stabilize the market without, without doing something uh, in terms of regulation. So basically, the third quarter GDP, it was beautiful, of course, but it was an aberration. So the first quarter, the fourth quarter will be uh, a much, much worse story. We're looking at 1%, 0, zero to 1%. Uh, if that's the case, it's time to open the champagne uh, because basically it should be uh, much, much worse than that. So uh, the economists are talking about a very weak recovery, and they're talking about 1%, 2% for another two years. So 10 and 11th should be uh, pretty much bad. Plus, it's okay because if I'm not mistaken, 2012 will all be dead, I think, uh, because there's a movie coming out next, on Friday. So it doesn't matter, really will be fine. So by the same token, yeah, it's a good source. It's a Maya calendar, so it's fine. 
<coughs> so um, the Japan and Europe will have even uh, worse uh, growth, but we have to worry about ourselves. Now, uh, the IMF put us to give some very nice uh, uh, charts, I like, like them because they've got colors and nuances and stuff, but basically they're saying that uh, in two years we'll have a growth of, of about 4%, which is cool, pretty much the same as the Japanese. By the same token, uh, the Eurozone will only um, nail about 1% growth. That's a bit of a problem. This is really fantastic because it talks about the G3 economies. Uh, that's very good. It's a very nice chart. Again, not lots of colors, but I think it's sort of old, sort of like ABBA music. Like, I'm sure it was nice at the time, but it was like, it was like 20 years ago. So in other words, what's missing here is China. So those guys are fine, but really they got very old business models. Um, also, just for comparison, the emerging, the, uh, the, uh, the advanced economies, way, way down here, talking about 2014, this, uh, this is uh, the IMF's forecast. The world economy not doing so badly overall, but really the growth will not come from the, the obvious players, but from the emerging markets. Think Russia, I mean, not Russia, think uh, China, uh, Brazil, and uh, India. Uh, and also for comparison, w the world versus us, we're not doing that well altogether. So the, the growth is very, very small. Uh, what else? Not, there's no big surprise here, but look at the current account balance. The US, we have a nice, hefty sort of account deficit, whereas the rest of the world, enormous, enormous account surplus. This cannot possibly be too good for us in the long term. Unemployment. That's a great chart. I love it. We are number one. So as of Friday, we nailed 10.2%. 10, 10 it's actually, it's, a, it's a, the official number. It's one of the worst possible things to look at because it's pretty fake. But we like it because you can com compare different uh, ec economies' uh, unemployment. And it's fake because... You can play games with it. So if you stop looking for jobs, or if you um, um, if you uh, take out the, the part-time jobs, you'll get not 10.2 percent because it's a psychological barrier. 10 percent is supposed to get very excited about this thing. Uh, the real unemployment rate, if you take out again uh, part-time jobs, and uh, if you take out uh, people who stop looking for jobs, it's more like 17.7 percent. Now that's a real number. And if you look in finance. Uh, let's not go there. Now, unemployment forecast by the IMF. Uh, peaking sometime next year and slowly uh, decreasing. Unemployment is about 10%, they're saying, of the official number in the Eurozone, more like 11% and change. They are doing a, a whole bunch of good things in the Eurozone. The problem in the Eurozone with the unemployment is that, well, they're socialist uh, uh, countries. And so, therefore, once you start working, you can do pretty much whatever you want. You'll, you'll uh, uh, keep your job. What they've been doing, besides uh, in France, they no longer hire people or too many people, but they only offer part-time jobs. So this way, they, cannot, they can finally fire people. So, but even so, the unemployment is supposed to rise, and Japan has very low unemployment. Now, the stock market has been a great success since March, and people were extremely slow to react to that. Even, uh, I'll have to say, about three weeks ago, uh, Rothschild uh, from a famous European group said that uh, people buying stocks are totally out of their minds and they their plans not to buy stocks. So, but, so, of course, this being said, a fantastic run in the stock market since March of this year. But that was because, first and foremost, the market was under tremendous, tremendous fear that the financial end is there because the market was oversold, because interest rates have been cut beyond belief, because we've been um, uh, working overtime uh, printing money. Uh, governments have been pretty much handing out money, like in our case, with cash for clunkers or cash for pens that don't work or cash for appliances or whatever you like. Uh, low inventories, level of inventories, and again, uh, very oversold conditions. But, of course, stock markets look forward, so 
it's a, it's a, it's from this point of view, it's a leading indicator. But really, there's no real growth. There's no growth to talk to speak about. Um, so we see people getting like you get some uh, surveys of sentiment, and sometimes they get very excited and they like things. And but there is no real growth. Interest rates cannot stay um, uh, at zero forever. So again, at the weekend we got very excited, the uh, G20, and said, oh, gee, "What does it mean? Oh, money can't oh, money can't good. Uh, they promise all kinds of things, but look at the fine uh, at the fine print. That's not what's going on really. So rates were not going to stay at zero forever." And in the long term, governments will have to eventually pay the money that they sort of made, printed. And this is going to be a very long term problem. So um, it's going to be a bit of an issue. Interest rates, uh, we're just above Japan, which is the nice pink line, whatever, mauve line. So we're pretty much back with Canada, at about 0%, let's say 0.25%, 25 basis points. But everybody else is a bit higher. So um, the Germany, Eurozone has higher rates, even the UK, which means it's much, much easier to buy euros versus the dollar or the Japanese yen. If you look at the interest rates in the US versus Australia and New Zealand, Australia hiked rates twice. So right now we have two countries, whose the economy is a matter, that hiked the interest rates. In Europe, is the only one is Norway. Uh, which has oil, and uh, second, the second one is Australia, which, Australia, which high rates twice in two months. They are fighting inflation. They, have one, they had one of the lightest recessions ever. And thank God China was helpful in this situation. So when you see this interest rate differential between our rates and what you have in Australia, it's, it's a very easy uh, uh, suggestion to buy Aussie and sell dollars. Um, so I, I mentioned uh, that the U.S. dollar is now a funding currency for carry trades, um, and this will remain in place for as long as the assets remain very, very cheap. Now the risk here is that we have we're getting a new, I was going to say a new uh, asset bubble, but probably maybe two asset bubbles, uh, because people are borrowing lots of dollars and buying whatever they want, uh, whatever you can think of, such as uh, uh, equities in India, equities in China, and many, many other things, but it's all on margin. So when the time comes that that will rebound, then you'll have a massive, massive problem. Uh, the only hope from this point of view is that the Fed will like, was likely to keep rates flat and the quant easing going on for a few more months, a, at least a few more months. Are you out of the woods in terms of the economy? Um, no. Uh, the residential property sector still is down by 30 percent. The commercial property, commercial property sector fell 40 percent and remains, remains the ticking bomb. If I'm not mistaken, there are some magic words we used to talk about. What was uh, the magic words early this year? Oh, TARP, uh, green shoots, uh, what else? Toxic assets. We forgot about those and I'm really happy with the green shoot thing because like, it's very boring. But, but the point of the matter is the toxic assets are doing just fine. They're still there. So, com so banks did not recognize uh, those, those losses. Uh, consumers are still afraid of getting debt. Now, of course, it's counterbalanced because they got way too much debt, but that's a different story. So really, there are some, some, some problems. And uh, again, the housing problem has not been addressed. Housing problems have not been addressed. Now, a weak dollar is really good for us. We can export more stuff. And our countries can export less to us, except maybe uh, for Japan and China. What the government is saying is that the dollar's decline is not out of hand. It's, a, it's an orderly decline. Therefore, it's fine. Uh, it's foreign exchange. We don't have a fear of a bear market. We have a bad, bad fear in the stock markets, not in the FX markets. So, well, dollar is going down. Great. If it's down, just sell the dollars and buy Aussie or Euros or what have you. So you're fine. Not a very big deal. So uh, the government says it's prepared for an event that the have is already a decline. It sounds very, very nice and encouraging, but let me tell you, there's no way they can be prepared. They weren't prepared uh, back in 85. When I, uh, in 95, they're not going to be prepared right now. There's nothing that they can do. So best of luck if that happens. Um, the government said that the dollar's 13% decline this year was simply a retracement of last year's surge. It was the biggest joke I've seen in my life. This is the official story, by the way. This is the biggest joke I've seen in my life because if you look at the chart, long-term chart, it's a tremendous downtrend. And in fact, that recovering was a, 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 a retracement. 
Um, on the plus side, you would know better than I do, I'm sure, uh, because you look at fixed income from what I understand. Uh, the auctions have been fantastic uh, overall. So people like to buy American debt. They do trust it because they know at the end of the day the government will make sure nobody will go big, will go out of business. So overall, uh, having a week that is not so bad. In fact, it's pretty good for us. Uh, government acknowledges that some critical fundamentals need to be addressed, the size of the Fed balance sheet, long-term fiscal outlook. That's such a long-term story, we don't really care about it. We will care for many generations, but that's a different story. So, the main, pro the main problem is that the dollar should be looking pretty, but somebody must pay eventually for all this stimulus package. Who? Well, us. When? I'm thinking uh, 50, 60 years. Uh, how? Any way they can. So it's a. Uh, so we went through historical changes this year. It wasn't a, a recession. It was a mother of all recessions. So this will just not going to go down. It will have an impact at all walks of life. It's a diff bit of a different order, but that's for a different uh, time. Now, as of this weekend, we no longer talk about exit strategies, which is a very cool topic until. The weekend. The coming the weekend, you know, things have just changed. That's not true. So that's why I said a bit earlier, uh, the G20 uh, countries said they will provide stimulus for as long as it takes. That's very nice. That's a pat on the back, all those nice things, and you feel comfortable, and we, know, and we feel less stressed. But Australia has already hiked rates twice. Norway hiked rates once. Japan will keep the rates low. But it's nothing new. They've been doing this forever. But at the end of the year, they will stop their um, uh, deep purchase of uh, commercial paper. VCB, they will decide what to do. But basically, they want to get corporations used to the idea that the times of easy money is uh, over. Um, so really, we are left with uh, two here, the UK and, and the US. And it's always good to look at the UK economy because it pretty much mimics what we do here. And um, they will expand uh, their um, quant easing program a little bit. They hope to wind it down by uh, sometime next year. It's nothing uh, clear. And in, in, in our case, we don't, the Fed has no choice but to keep rates very, very low and uh, keep on buying uh, debt on the hope that there will be some sort of fix in the market. Now, so there are some strategies for, for those that can. What I don't know, all these things don't answer the question, what happened to the toxic assets? Doesn't answer the question, what happened to that enormous amount of money, $750 uh, trillion, uh, billion dollars, that was given to someone which you don't know exactly who it is earlier this year. So medium term outlook and the pretty much long term outlook. Well, there, there is no reason, there is no reason to expect a change from what we've seen in the past several months. Uh, which means dollar has to remain under pressure because of the uh, stimulus, because you have a biggest problem, because um, U.S. dollar is, is, um, is um, uh, funding currency for, uh, uh, for carry trades, uh, because the gold is uh, so strong, uh, because the stock market should remain sideways to higher. In other words, we sort of reached the appropriate time frame for a peak, and I personally I thought that the peak was in about 10 days ago. But then you saw the market yesterday and said, well, you got to stay with it. So for as long as it's not confirmed uh, to, to have a reversal, you just have to stay long. And that's pretty much it. Now, risk to, uh, any, to any kind of uh, change of this nature is, well, as I mentioned, type of, type of a peak. And these markets are s significantly overbought. We don't have that much time, so let me go a bit faster here. Uh, technical analysis. Again, in foreign exchange, you don't have a luxury of too many fundamentals, and we have to look at technicals much, much closer. So, just very briefly, on to to, not to introduce, to mention some of the, most of the tools I use in uh, the reports I put out on the CME's uh, website uh, three times a day, just because they have three time zones uh, out there. So, candlesticks, of course, trend analysis, of course, exponential moving averages, GAN analysis, Elliott Wave, Fibonacci. Ichimoku Cloud, MACD, and Fast Stochastics. So we're just very briefly just go, to go through these things. Candlesticks, on one hand, remain the richest source of 
single chart uh, uh, signals by the same token being so popular and everybody knowing about it, they don't, uh, it doesn't provide that much information any anymore. So use it, but not on its own. So for instance, you got a very nice uh, bullish reversal, a hammer, back in March. But by the way, it's a weekly chart in, in uh, Euro dollars. A classic bullish flag and another bullish flag, so it keeps on going. But when it comes to reversals, we have three, four f uh, fake reversals every single time there is a top. But really, that's only fake because there's no confirmation. So if you draw a simple support line that was never broken, if you use a moving average as, as confirmation, but was never broken. So for as long as this line stays in place, stay long and happy. Andrew Speechford, just very quick introduction. All that, that this thing does is once you have a pullback, it measures the possible new path of the currency, so, of the market. So for instance, in this case, the lowest low and the highest high. And once you connect this thing, you, you, you connect this lowest low and the highest high, then from the highest high, you go to the lowest low of the pullback, and then you extend it. So the market shifts from this direction, if you wish, from the lowest low to the highest high to the lowest low to the median of a pullback, and then you extend it. Now, if you do that straightforward, if you wish, you're going to be missing, you're going to have only three lines. So the core prong and this one and this one, nothing in the middle. What I did was I cut this in two because this will get a bit more detail. So you want to get as part detail as possible. So pretty much you can see market is moving in within, this, uh, within these two lines. Uh, what else? Exponential, exponential moving averages. Well, people use moving averages for many, many reasons, and uh, we don't have time, time to talk about this in detail, but one of the reasons is people like intersections, and my suggestion is don't ever use intersections or two moving averages as an entry or exit point. Those are confirmations. Those are very, very slow. So really, to make a long story short, is there are two, well, there is one to keep in mind, a 21-day moving average or 20-day moving average. Make it exponential. That's very nice. That's the green line here goes above your buy, goes below your sell, goes above your buy, goes below your sell. When we go sideways, you don't pay attention. The second moving average here is a 55-day moving average. So 21 and 55 are Fibonacci numbers, and here you have it, or 20 or 60, whatever you like. So really, in the case of these trending markets, you have very strong trends, equities and gold um, and currencies. So for as long as these this markets stay above the 55-day moving average, they'll keep on going higher. So if 21 breaks from time to time, it's because they're so overbought. But unless 55 day gives way on a closing basis, stay long and happy. Um, we can skip that. Unfortunately, it's a great chart, but just to sort of prove it that if you stay long above a 20, 20 week moving, 21 week moving average, should have been long starting in 2007, get out in July of last year, buy again sometime a bit of a from November, December. And then if you got long again in, in May, just stay long and again, uh, happy. <coughs> GAN analysis. It's almost, I just want to mention this thing because the most thing is, GAN just means it's a four letter word, but it is, but it's also one of the most fantastic uh, w ways of getting some signals. It does many, many things. But uh, just FYI, it's a combination of uh, Fibonacci and um, uh, Elliott Wave and uh, GAN. Uh, I don't know if you use Fibonacci fan lines. I'm going to show an example a bit later on. But this is a GAN. All it means, let's say it's a different angle. Once, uh, in this case, the Dow on a weekly basis broke above 8900, 8, but it was a signal to buy much, much more. So uh, between this and having a bullish flag, you have some uh, real action. And right now, in the wave four on a weekly base on a weekly basis, so that means there's a bit much more room to go on the upside. Now, here's the thing: the most the Dow could go is, let's say, roughly eleven thousand five hundred. If it goes that far, we'll all be very happy. However, if we see in that area, remember the Elliott waivers are going to sell the hell out of it because and will take a huge risk. If they're right, well, obviously, if they're right, if they're wrong, they have to, have to buy back. So this is your line in percent, because this is the bottom of wave number one, like 11,500. 
Um, okay, Elliot Wave on a uh, weekly basis. Elliot Wave on the S&P 500. I know we had a big move yesterday, but please remember there are two things. First thing is the, the S&P 500 extended 50% of a move between March and June. And that was 50% extension, but was back in October. That is also the fifth subwave of a fifth wave in Elliott Wave. So this should pretty much it. Even if you don't follow, follow, follow Elliott Wave, that is the most you can go. Markets do what they want to do, but, but based on that, a major peak is in place, and it should be going down from here. We'll see if this is the case. Uh, Euro versus the S&P 500, both seem to have peaked a couple of weeks ago. Let's see if it's going to hold. And uh, if you look again at GAN analysis, here's your trading range. And uh, it seems to be more room on the downside. Uh, Fibonacci, when people talk about Fibonacci, by definition, they think that this means retracement levels, but in reality, you have horizontal lines, everybody knows, knows 38.2 and all those things, but in addition, you can use fan lines. I recommend that a lot because it's a very simple tool to use, number one. Number two, everybody knows about horizontals, not so much about the fan lines. Number three, being at an angle, you get your signal to buy or to sell way before the 38.2% retracement, horizontal line. So it's a big advantage. And again, I'm a bit rushing here. And one thing to keep in mind is you got three major ways of doing retracements. Horizontal lines, you all know, know, we all know this, the, the thing. The fan lines, which if you look right now, this is Aussie daily chart, very strong support. But also the arcs. And the way the Fibonacci arcs work is pretty simple, actually. You connect in a trend the lowest low and the highest high. On it, you measure your Fibonacci retracements, 23.6, 20, 20, 38.2, and so on and so forth. If you have a compass, you stick the needle on the, in the highest level and the pen at 23.6, one arc, 38.2, the second arc, and you keep on going. Now, look at this arc, which is 23.6 like a charm, it's holding very good support. Most people don't use it because, oh, it's arcs. It's, it's, I think it's a very simple tool to use, as you could see. So you might have to keep this in mind because it helps. Uh, one last thing, and then I have to rush to the last uh, uh, segment <coughs> of a presentation. I don't think you've seen this before, and if you did, let me know where. Um, we like to talk about Fibonacci retracements all day long. But again, we've been sort of programmed to think horizontal lines, 38.250, 61.8, very rarely use. There are four more that you should be using. But people don't do that. But here you have a channel. And in this channel, being parallel, you can measure the distance between the two sides of a channel. And if you do a measurement, 38.2, 50, and 61.8, you get this area of retracements. So when the markets have no idea what to do, guess where you find them? So when you when we pull back to safety, then you know value is very low. People don't know what to do. What will be the next move? So right now we're just in uh, the case of yours. We are just approaching uh, approaching this area. So keep this in mind because this works very very nicely. Um, let me sort of jump a little bit. So talk a little bit about. FX proper. Why do people should people trade? Uh, why should people trade uh, futures versus uh, cash FX? Well, first of all, foreign exchange, depending on uh, regardless of your area of interest. Foreign exchange bottom line remains the most efficient, the, mo the easiest to reach shock absorber of the markets. You don't like uh, uh, Brazil, actually, you all, we all like Brazil these days. Uh, you sell it or you buy it. You like euros, you buy it. You hate euros, you sell it. 
uh, the UK. It was a fantastic buy a long time ago, like, oh, yesterday. But today we have found out that Fitch uh, provided some warning about, uh, about um, their uh, currency rating and uh, sterling collapsed. So it's very easy to, to, to do what you want to do any time of the day. And markets are always, always open. They're always, always liquid. So it's a big advantage. Now, you can trade OTC, you can trade futures. But in the currency futures, let me skip everything here. In the currency futures, uh, you have some big advantages. Now, also, it's very important to remember some uh, sort of a very obvious thing, but you got to remember. The biggest players in foreign exchange are banks. Because everybody else, central bank or what have you, corporation, prop shop, pension fund, and so on and so forth, they all have to go, pre, uh, hedge fund, they all have to go through banks. So this is your core player. Now, in FX, you have spot, two business days, for a dollar rise sometime in the future, swaps, a bit of more complex sort of uh, fixed income sort of instrument, currency futures, and then you have other things, options and uh, NDFs. Now, why do people, why would people trade, uh, talk about futures? Well, first and foremost is when you trade, you want, what do you want? You want the price, which is a tight, has a tight spread, and a liquid market. Futures provide all these things. It's a very open, it's a very transparent market. Now, the rest of the OTC nowadays is also transparent, but when it comes to the futures market, it's really, uh, you know this because you look at other markets and you think futures are always uh, if it's the market, but in FX it's a bit different. So um, you trade currency futures uh, 24 hours a day, uh, very low prices, and for me it has been a fantastic, uh, uh, fantastic uh, feature, the fact that it's a very secure place to trade. Now, this has been the case since the beginning of currency futures. But honestly, but like, it's true, but like, who cared five years ago or four years ago? Well, I think in the last year or so, we sort of realized how good this thing is. Because all of a sudden, uh, nowadays we think things have been stabilized. They've been stabilized. But the, major, the largest banks in this country have enormous, still have enormous problems. UK banks still have enormous problems. So we're not really out of the woods. So this is a fantastic, fantastic uh, tool to have. So it's liquid and there's the government behind it. So via VCFTC, um, you get your price any, anywhere you want. It's a very tight price. Do you want to trade futures st straight? Do you want to trade um, on um, um, side by side, like, like the cash market? Whatever you want, it's in there. So it's a very easy market to access. Anyone can trade small amounts or large amounts. It's a secure market. It's a liquid market. It's a very transparent uh, market. And Dave mentioned a bit earlier. Uh, he wants me to talk about to mention uh, to mention uh, the um, the COT. And um, I'll come back to this thing here after talking about COT. For many of you. Talking about access to information about volume and open interest uh, in your specific markets may sound like a not, not, not a very big deal. For us in foreign exchange, this is a huge, huge deal because you have all kinds of, like, when you talk about technical analysis, you, one of the rules is I have a breakout through a trend line. Uh, one of the conditions is on, on big volume. What does big volume mean? We have no idea. So pretty much we don't know what volume is. In, uh, so in the case of a futures market, you have access to this information. So getting information about, the OTC, about COT is fantastic because you want to see uh, what the non-commercial respect guys are doing. Commercials, these guys are looking to hedge, but these guys are looking to take risk. So we want to see how are these guys positioned. And for as long as the numbers are sort of normal, you don't care that much. But when you have a big change, then you care. Or you say, right now it's pretty obvious. But everybody's very, very long foreign currencies because everybody's selling dollars, except for the uh, yen. So everybody's very long Aussie and Canadian dollars and the euros and so on and so forth. So now you're looking at this number saying, well, okay, great. Obviously, it's an uh, uptrend for these currencies. Everybody's very, very long. But, but eventually you'll have a turn point. When that happens and you know that these guys are very, very long, they, may, they become top heavy. So be, they'll be forced to, 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 to get out of their positions. Also, those who care about this kind of information also sort of write down somewhere when they saw big increases in open interest. 
and so roughly you can tell it, you know, which areas we bought a lot. Once the market retraces to those areas, we're going to have no choice but get out. And um, please keep in mind one very sort of very basic thing. One of the ma major reasons why the stock market collapsed, the way it collapsed uh, through March of this year, or oil collapsed last year, and then the way it recovered, they recovered, both markets recovered, is because of the funds, because they're uh, trade, trade based on models. And so if my model doesn't know what your model does and vice versa, but if my model sees enough movement in one market, it's going to go long or short. And when yours sees the same thing and goes long or short, and it's a, it has a snowball effect. So because of that, all the peaks and troughs are going to be much more significant and they'll become more so, not less so. So it's very easy to turn around one of these, one of these markets. So this gives you, for us, it's unbelievable, unbelievable information. Let me just go back, uh, just going back to, the, to recent uh, uh, FX futures. I already mentioned it's a very deep market. It's affordable, so anybody can trade. Uh, you have to trade la large, that's great, small amount, that's great. Uh, earlier this year, uh, the CME group introduced uh, the uh, E-Micros, which is a fantastic instrument. Why is it a fantastic instrument? Well, because it's very small. So if you trade uh, retail, it's not a big deal to get involved. It costs close to nothing to, the uh, margin costs close to nothing to have control over some currencies. Uh, slowly but surely, what you're going to see is uh, corporations getting involved into, into, this, into the e-micros because they are traded much more, they code it like VFX, the currency uh, markets. In currency markets, you have two types of codes, you call them European and American. European means for one buck you get X number of Swiss francs or yen and Canadian dollars. American terms means for one unit of foreign currency you get so many dollars. So for one euro you get 1.40, for one, let's say, uh, for one pound you get 1.60, for one Aussie you get 90 something cents. Um, when you trade futures, because they made the contract like the rest of the markets, everything is in American terms. So never dollars, always size of the contracts in foreign currency. You go to e micros, they are quoted exactly like the cash market. So, from this point of view, if, you're, if people get sometimes scared of currency futures, they trade exactly like, like the OTC market. Uh, also, because they're very, very small, when you look into hedge as a corporation, you can adjust the position that you have by using e micros. It's a fantastic tool they put together. Uh, futures, you can hedge all you like. Uh, I can arbitrage all you like, speculation, of course. Uh, once again, you have access to volume and open interest. Once again, in foreign exchange, we don't have access to volume and open interest. This is vital information. We don't have access to it except for what you get from a futures market. Price discovery, open for all, so large or small, the same thing. And once again, last but not the least, there is no credit risk. And Dave just mentioned the newest uh, tool that... Uh, the CME group will, will, will uh, offer next year. But it's a fantastic group because, because when, it comes, when it comes to this feature, there's still a tremendous need out there in the OTC market. So we sort of, uh, and sort of reached the end of this, uh, of this presentation. I would have liked to use another, spend another hour or so. Um, l just let me leave you here with... Um, if I'm not mistaken, with a site where you can find, should you care about foreign exchange, uh, where you can uh, get, you can see the reports. So I'm putting out this uh, uh, research three times a day. So if you want to know what's going to involve the foreign exchange, that's the source to go to. And I want to thank you very much for participation. And any questions? Now is a good time to. You mentioned somewhere about the middle of, of the presentation about how interest rates can't stay low forever. Yes. And then you put up a graph that included a chart of the Japanese Japanese interest rates, which have been one percent or less for uh, uh, point, point, point one percent. Point one. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it can happen there, not not here. So uh, the Japanese economy, the Japanese economy is a bit of a different different uh, animal. So um, I'm going a bit off track here, but for instance, uh, they are very competitive people. But, and of course, among themselves, among corporations in Japan, when it comes to uh, attacking the global market, they all of a sudden become very close friends. Uh, think of a government more like um, a, a careful father or nurturing mother, one of those things, or a combination of the two. So, if this, so uh, governments in Japan are very, very weak 
compared to the, the economic strength. And uh, they're a function of a big business. And the big business needs does better if they keep low interest rates very, very low. And if the big guys do well, then everybody else in the country lives decently, not necessarily very well, but decently. So it's a very different approach. So yes, surely it's a capitalist environment with many, many other mixes. We don't have that here. Uh, no, in, no, no. Uh, it may be, I mean, it may be the case we're going to stay with low rates uh, probably for two more years, could be, but it's a very different, we have different dynamics here. It's a totally different, different uh, mentality in, in the States. Uh, on that point, what, what in the United States, uh, populist, is, is, is that what would drive the government, like the big business drives the government in Japan, what would, what would be the uh, uh, equal to that in the United States? I really can't say because I'm getting filmed. Um, uh, but uh, let's, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's just... Uh, let's <laughs> uh, Robbies, I guess. Huh? Uh, let, let, let's just say... Uh, um, uh, let's just say the government is faced with a problem which is the problem is, unfortunately, they are too big to fail. Uh, and government is looking at measures to fix that. I don't think this can be, uh, uh, they can find a solution. Uh, because just in a very simple way, if Citibank, for instance, uh, not take the big under, but Citibank came very close to going under, right? But if they go, uh, go under, there's a bit of a problem. Or people said, why did that, was, is GM getting so much help? Really? I mean, they got more help than, you know, God. So not only money, but also these cash flow clunkers. What do you think? But the point of the matter is, if they go under, it's not only GM going under; it's many, many other companies going under. Mm -hmm. So it's it's so so. Bottom line, I think um, certain companies cannot be allowed to uh, to allowed to go under. Um, I don't know. Uh, what, I, what I know is that I didn't hear anything about this in the last several months. Uh, from what I understand, people that trade that, it's a decent market, and it's a, it's a, uh, it's a political issue as opposed to uh, any other type of issue. So in other words, if I have the toxic assets and you, a fund, come, come and buy from me, I'm taking the loss, and you buy a great position at a very low price. I, I have no interest to say it. I don't get anything. I don't, it doesn't fix my problems, and I only to reach you, which I don't care about. So I don't see how you can find a solution here. Your thoughts on the Gulf states wanting a basket of currencies? They're hedging toward that. No, no. We want to, we want to have a local, We want to have a, a, a common currency. It's a it's a matter of pride. So we don't. So what they want is to have their own currency. Hmm? Uh, no, that, that, that currency should, should be uh, sort of uh, semi pegged to a basket of our currencies, but we don't have one common currency in, uh, in uh, GCC. Will they have an ETF based on that? Well, they must have a currency first. Yeah, well, later. Yeah. Well, I'm sure, I mean, surely. Uh, uh, we, we'll, we'll make sure but to, to, to bring many, many other uh, uh, instruments around it. But that's a political decision on their side. We want to feel very strong. And once again, unfortunately, very men are one horse race. In a one-horse race, we only produce one thing, nothing else. So would you like to uh, project on the value of the dollar when that happens? Would you no. I mean, dollar has nothing to do, I mean, uh, uh, to v v has no impact on the dollar. So uh, what you mean when, when, when uh, the GCC has a, a sequel currency? Mm -hmm. I mean, no impact. Couldn't care less. But it's just pride, national, local pride, and show that they do something. But I don't understand how that changes the fact that the economy is not diversified. I don't know, despite the fact that they have such enormous amounts of money, we only want to show something off that is uh, Dubai, which Dubai doesn't even have oil. So pretty much uh, you don't see the money uh, being uh, uh, used for infrastructure or for, uh, for diversifying their economy. So. What are your thoughts about, it's a big topic, and I don't know if you have any counterweights, but uh, the, the value of the dollar versus the Chinese yuan and uh, what will happen that we're allowed to approach to uh, value of treasuries? Um, the, 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 you, don't, you don't know because you don't know at what time we're going to allow to, 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 to uh, move to move freely. 
uh, that is uh, one of the biggest issues because on one hand it's saying we're not moving, on the other hand if you look at the chart it shows that the yuan is getting stronger and stronger, it should be much much stronger, much much stronger, but the point of the matter is, uh, see we may not like it here, but think yourself, put yourself, put, put yourself in their shoes, I think they're doing just fine, it, it, it's not good for us, but it's good for them. Because surely they could do much, much better in a normal environment. This is not an, a normal environment. It's normal only because the media tells us so. It's normal because you look at, at the stock market and say, okay, okay, uh, so my, my retirement money, my 401k, is lower than uh, a year ago, but it's not so bad. It's not so, uh, two years ago, but no, it's not so bad. So that's why it's normal. It's not normal at all. So, uh, what, so if you look overall at China, they're doing just fine. And if you don't believe me, look at the Australian economy. It's a small, it's a small uh, sign, a small measure. They are doing fine. They had the, the lightest recession ever. In this situation where it's the disaster, it's the worst in 100 years, Australia says it's the lightest recession. So the Chinese economy is doing fine. So when we want, you want to be allowed to, um, uh, to move freely, I don't know. It's going to be a while. Let's keep it in mind that the Chinese financial system is not as great, uh, not as strong as one might like to, to believe. It will take a bit of time. It will take a bit of time. They're fantastic, fantastic people. Uh, fantastic. Uh, they realize fantastic things. Um, for them, it works having a centralized economy and a fairly centralized financial system. Once it opens up, it's going to be a big, big shakeup. Nobody's, uh, and I don't think we want it here at this point in time. So it's going to be enormous because that means government will be out of touch. So it's, it'll be a big event. What could make the FX market contract? Well, it, it, it did contract a little bit since uh, September, since, uh, in the past 14 months. But um, it's nothing to talk about. I mean, I mean, uh, of course, I'm to talk about. It's nothing uh, dramatic, because for the longest time, when I was teaching course about foreign exchange, I always said when the growth is going to come from the emerging markets, and then it's still, like sort of wishful thinking. And now, what do emerging what, what do emerging markets mean? Once again, it's China, India, Russia, depending. Russia can be in the second uh, place. Um, those economies are huge huge. Now, to g so from this point of view, they will keep the volume growing. Now, answering your question, it's, a, it's long term though. China, even though it doesn't have a currency to speak of uh, as of now because the yuan is very controlled and all those things, China has been doing slowly a lot of things to move outside the dollar. And so a lot of Southeast Asian nations trade based on the yuan, even though yuan, as we all know, is not convertible. So it's just credits and debits. Uh, also, China has a very large number of swaps, not only in the Southeast Asia, which you, which you may say it makes sense, but also with Latin America. So slowly, a lot of volume in foreign exchange has been moving outside the dollar. So that, I think, answers your questions to some extent. Besides that, nothing dramatic. So the classic reasons are not going to be there. FX now it means funds, means uh, retail business, which has been hurt, of course, this year, uh, but primarily fund business. And then you have banks and uh, so on and so forth, investment banks, former investment banks. I think uh, we have only one investment bank right, right now, is it? Lazar Frey? I think it's that, the only one. Any other questions? Go in once. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much. I want to quickly uh, thank Cornelius and Dave for today's presentation. As you can tell, Cornelius had, a, I think he had 105 slides. So we will be sending out all of these slides to everyone that uh, participated today and RSVP'd, and we'll be posting those on our website. And uh, finally, this we have one more web or one more seminar for the re for the end of the year, which will be on weather products next month, and then we'll be kicking off January with a with a seminar on tax strategies for traders. So thanks again for coming, and uh, we welcome your feedback.